and we'll read the text from Hebrews chapter 8, verses 7 through 13, as we continue our, our study of Hebrews. <clears throat> Hebrews 8, 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Jacob, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and lawless deeds I will remember no more. In that, he says, a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we confess that as we come to your word, there are a great many things that are beyond us. We get glimpses, we see through a glass darkly, and those things that you do give us to see change our lives. They make us different. Lord, I pray that you would do that today, that we would be open, Lord, to what you want to show us today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. I would appreciate your prayers as I uh, share this message with you. There are, there are so many things that have to do with covenant that a person could spend a long time, I mean, like, you know, maybe a couple months of Sundays, um, just talking about all the details of, of covenant, which is a huge deal. I mean, it's a big deal. But, um, but today, I'm not going to go into all the details, but we are going to just simply look at the fact that we have a new covenant and what that means for us. Because um, this is really um, a big deal. This is like the heart of the transition between the old and the new. And we have a new covenant and we have a better covenant. So um, probably the biggest difference between the two, I'll just give you this little detail, is that the first covenant was made between God and the people. The people all said, we'll do what God said. That was their part of the covenant. It was like agreeing that they're going to do, they're going to keep their end of it. Well, what the old law, one of the things that it did, Paul said it highlighted sin. It really brought it into sharp relief. What it proved over and over and over again is that they couldn't do it. They couldn't keep their side of the bargain. And um, so God made a new covenant, and he already testified to it in the Old Testament when he made his first covenant with Abraham, which was, in a sense, different than the one that he made with, through Moses and the people. Because when he made the covenant with Abraham, he was looking forward to Jesus, the person that he was saying is going to come, through whom all nations of the world would be blessed, was the offspring of Abraham, who is Jesus. It was in the singular, and Paul makes a big deal out of that in the book of Galatians. He didn't say seeds like many, but he said, your seed, and Paul said, which is Christ. And in this covenant, which is now being put into effect, this is the new covenant. Because Jesus came and the covenant is not in force until the death of the one who makes it. That's one of the aspects of covenant making. There's an element of death in it. You give up your life when you enter into a covenant. Give up your right to ever change it. So it's like, it's like a testament or it's like we call it a will. It's pretty close. Not quite, but pretty close. Person dies, his will goes into effect, it can't be altered. And so, um, so this new covenant is now in effect because Jesus is the one who made it and he was the one who God covenanted to send and that is now in effect and his will is now unalterable. It's in effect and it's in effect forever. So that's one of the differences between the old and the new covenant. We have an, a covenant that is now in effect for eternity because 
because uh, the priest who is officiating is also eternal. And um, we have all these things in the book of Hebrews, why it's so much better. Well, that's just one aspect of it. We have this new covenant, and it doesn't rest with our part of keeping it. That doesn't affect it at all. What it, God is saying is he couldn't swear by anything greater, so he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing, I'm going to bless you. And multiplying, I'm going to multiply you. And in your seed, all nations of the earth shall be blessed. So this is a covenant that God made with himself, that he himself would get off the throne, as it were, come down, become one of us, and save us. Save us, sanctify us, perfect us. And um, the problem that we as Christians face is that we tend to look at ourselves, we tend to look at Christian culture, we tend to look around us and ask, well, what is the problem? Why are not the wonderful promises that are associated with the new covenant uh, more in evidence than they are? And, uh, and then we sort of strike about in ways that we might remedy this situation. And it goes in many, many different directions. But, um, but I would like to, again this morning, just help us to look at the problem. Look at the need and what I believe God says is the solution to this. When Jesus came, he didn't lower the bar like we so often do. When things don't quite match up to scripture, what we tend to do is lower the bar and say, well, you know, this is normal for Christians. This is normal for us. And we find a way to sort of theologize our way into where we now exist. Jesus didn't do that. He came and raised the bar, raised it much higher than the old covenant was, and took it from the external to the internal. And um, he just made some dramatic statements. I mean, you guys, you as Christians, you as followers of Jesus are the light of the world. You are the world's hope, as it were. You are what this world needs. You are the salt of the earth. You are what preserve humanity. That's what Jesus was saying. And, um, and he took it, uh, he just, every, in everything that he addressed in the Sermon on the Mount, which is sort of the charter of this new covenant, uh, he raised the bar. And he raised it so high, it's incredible. It's like, he said, be you therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now, if you look anywhere other than to the covenant and to what God has promised to do, you'll never realize that perfection. But, uh, but in the book of Hebrews, it's all over. You know, it's like it's all through the, uh, the writings. Look at chapter 9, verse um, 8. He is comparing the two again. And... Um, he says, the Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was standing because there was this huge veil between the holy place and the holiest of all. So the way to God's presence was not yet opened. But on the cross, remember that it was torn in two from top to bottom. Now the new covenant, we have access. We can go right into the presence of God. And that's a huge deal. That's big. So, um, and look at what it says. It was symbolic, this first covenant, for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices were offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect. See? The first covenant could not make you perfect. So uh, when Jesus said, be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect, he had a plan, he had a way in which that could happen. That we could be perfect. We could come into the presence of God Perfect. So, um, so we couldn't make, be made perfect in regard to the conscience, concerned only with foods and drinks and various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of Reformation. Let me give you another one. In chapter 10, it says, Every priest, speaking of the Old Covenant again, stands ministering daily, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. It's like they just pushed them back, but they never really dealt with them. But this man... Speaking of Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, 
sat down at the right hand of God. Did you know that in the temple and in the tabernacle, there's no place for the priest to sit? He could never sit down because he was never finished. He had to do it over and over every day and over day after day. He was never done. But Jesus, one sacrifice forever, seated at the right hand of God. He's done. The deed is done. The work is done. From that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. Now listen to this. For by one offering he has perfected forever. One offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. This, um, this speaks of two things that are, that are extremely important to understand if you want to live a successful Christian life. Number one is when you come to Jesus, there is a perfection that happens inside of you that will never be, um, never gain anything. It is absolutely perfect. There's a place inside that is absolutely holy. It'll never become holier than it is right now. It's the place where Jesus lives, inside of you. This is based on the promise of God. This is part of the new covenant. He's going to, he didn't say it, he said he's going to write his law in their hearts. How does he do it? By coming and living inside. Jesus said, I'll be with you and in you. When he comes to live inside of you, there's a place in there that's as holy as it's ever going to get. And that's the part that you can live out of. That's the whole new covenant. You can live out of the life of Jesus inside of you. And through that, your outward life will become sanctified. Okay? That's what it says. He perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So you have both this instantaneous work that happens the moment you open up your heart to Jesus and receive him, and we call that being born again. And then from then on, it's a life of growth in grace and growth in faith. You're going from faith to faith and from grace to grace, but it's all coming from that inner life that you have, the presence of God inside. So... um, <clears throat> I'm going to use just one example because, because it affects every area of our life. I'm going to use the example of food because I think it's easy for us to understand, but um, it is a challenge even to our faith to accept what God says about it. In, um, in Mark, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7, Jesus is speaking about the scribes and Pharisees. I don't know how much time I want to take to read all this, but they were, the scribes and Pharisees saw Jesus' disciples eat food without washing their hands ceremonially. Remember, it said various washings. So you have all these washings, and they're endless in the Old Testament. I doubt if it's possible for anybody to ever keep them all. And here the scribes and Pharisees are even adding to them yet. You know, it's like endless washings. Just wash everything. And, and all of that is simply symbolic, pointing to the perfect cleansing that Jesus provides for us. Perfect. Absolutely complete. It is completely finished. But anyway, um, so they saw this and they said, well, why don't you, um, why do your disciples eat with unwashed hands? And this was Jesus' answer, but I'm not going to go into all that. I'm just going to give you the explanation that he gave to his disciples when they asked him afterward. He said, Are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him? Because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach, and is eliminated. And then there's a note that the gospel writers, or the translators, believe is made by Mark as a way of explanation. He says, thus purifying all foods. Okay? All this thing about clean and unclean foods comes to an end right here. Because Jesus is saying that food can't defile you. That's the word of God. That's a part of this new covenant. Food can't defile you. And we'll see why later. But... um, But what does defile you, it's not what goes in your mouth, but it's what comes out. That's what defiles you. 
Because out of the mouth, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications. And we could, just, uh, we could just go on and on with a list of the things that come out of your heart. And they usually come out of your mouth at some time or other too. So it's what comes out of your mouth. You know, um, we get really concerned about things, and it's probably good that we do. Things like uh, high fructose corn syrup. And now uh, we just passed it by an overwhelming majority in San Juan County, no GMO foods. I'm for it, you know, but um, no GMO foods. Well, that's a big deal, but um, it's not half the deal. It's not a fraction of the deal of what comes out of our mouth. It will not affect us one-tenth or one-hundredth of a percent as much as what comes out of our heart, comes out of our mouth. That's a way bigger deal than high fructose corn syrup or GMO foods or anything else that you can think about that's bad for you. See? But the New Covenant addresses that. Addresses that deal about a change of heart and to make us clean on the inside so that what comes out is clean. And, um, and that what goes in doesn't really matter. <clears throat> and we'll see about that. But, um, but do you have faith for that? Do you believe that the word of God can make every food clean? Do you believe that? That you can eat anything and it'll be good for you if he blesses it. See, that's a big deal. That's faith. When you hear the word and you believe it, then it becomes true for you to the point where Jesus said in Mark 16, these signs shall follow those that believe that if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. Why? Because of the word of God. And because we believe it. He said everything is clean. And so that makes it clean to us. So do you believe that his blessing can sanctify any food? See, this is a spiritual reality. It's not just about something physical. This is spiritual truth. This is spiritual reality. The blessing of God, the blessing of Jesus, sanctifies any food. I don't believe that we're to tempt God and go out and drink poison just to prove that it's true. But we shouldn't worry about it. We can trust him. We can trust God with the things that we eat. Uh, 1 Timothy 4, 1 to 5, really sums it up, and it shows that, uh, that the disciples actually believed this. 1 Timothy 4. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. I mean, this sounds really bad, right? Callous consciences that just... And it's supposed to be, you know, promoting truth, right? Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. So um, it's like when you try to address this problem of sin around us, uh, be careful that you don't go off on some rabbit trail that leads nowhere except to disappointment. Because um, it's very, very critical that we stay with the conditions of the new covenant. And we'll get to that. Every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So that's a challenge, isn't it? To really believe that your food can be sanctified when you give thanks for it and ask God to bless it. That it makes it clean, makes it good for your body, that it gives you health, and you can believe for good health, you know? I pray for it. I believe in divine healing. I've got a back thing going on right now. And I went to the chiropractor, but I know that all healing comes from God. And I'm praying for healing for my back, and I believe he's going to heal it. But I believe too, and this just in, in inspires my faith to believe that when I, I don't want to eat food that I don't ask the blessing on. Because look at what it does, you know? It makes it clean. Isn't that amazing? No wonder we can go anywhere and eat what they eat without asking any question for conscience sake. Because we believe that God cleanses it. 
we used to sort of joke about it before I really even understood this. We, you know, I used to be in, in the Mennonite church. I was on the mission board, and we went to different places and ate things that, um, that sometimes we'd slip a little under the table to the dogs. But, but you know, um, but to know this is just amazing, you know, that when food is blessed, God will sanctify it. He says he will. Um, how much more even than food people. Now we're at the heart of this thing. If God can bless food and sanctify it, how much more you and me? He can sanctify us. He can make us perfect. That there's a place inside of us, in our hearts, that is absolutely clean, that is sinless, that is uh, perfect in his sight. The old could not do that. The old covenant could not do that. And um, Peter, when he was up on the housetop, remember the story? He was about to go to Cornelius and the gospel was just going out. Jesus said it would go from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. Well, it had already gone to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, but now it's going out to the Gentiles. And Peter is up on the housetop praying and God lets this sheet come down in front of him. In fact, God uh, uses the same illustration I do this morning, you know. He used food. He let this big sheet come down in front of Peter that had all kinds of creepy crawly things that the Old Testament had forbidden to eat as unclean. He said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, not so, Lord. He said, I've never eaten anything common or unclean. And that happened three times. Well, a threefold testimony is as good as it gets in the New Testament, or in the Bible, I mean. That's God. You know, he gives a threefold testimony, and that's, you've got it then. If you don't get it in threefold, you're not going to get it. But anyway, Peter got it three times, and then God said every time, he said, whatever God has cleansed, you don't call common or unclean. And then, as soon as this was over, the people from Cornelius' house were there, and, and they came and said that the Lord gave a vision to Cornelius. They said, we're to come and find Simon in Joppa, and, or at the house of Simon, and, and that you're supposed to come with us. And Peter went, and says he went, nothing doubting. It's like he knew that whatever was happening, God was in it. So he went to Cornelius' house, and here was a Gentile believer, someone who believed in God and gave alms and prayed. And, um, and as he preached, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as he had on the apostles and those 120 gathered in Jerusalem on Pentecost. And what could Peter say? He said, I perceive that in every nation he that fears God is accepted of him. And what God did is he showed Peter is that he had cleansed those people. They were clean. You know? They were perfect. There was nothing to be added. It's like this is as good as it gets. So um, all this sprinkled animal blood, holy water, ceremonial cleansing pointed to a spiritual reality is that we are washed, we are sanctified, it said. In one place it talks about a whole list of sins, you know, that people do. It says, such were some of you, but now you're washed. Now you're sanctified. Sanctified means holy and set apart for the service of God. <clears throat> So um, in verse 43 of that uh, story, Peter summarizes it by saying, To him all the prophets, that is to Jesus, all the prophets witness, that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. That's clean. When you believe in Jesus, you receive remission of sins, and you are clean. Outward laws and commandments can restrain sin. More importantly, they can expose sin, but they can never make a person blessed like Matthew 5 blesses them. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness' sake. I mean, this is the word of God, you know. No outward law can, can make that happen. You know, no outward law can do that, but the word of God can bless um, a heart that believes it. 
can never make Shaw Fellowship like a city set on a hill that can't be hidden, that lights up the surrounding community. Only God can do that. No outward law can do it. And that's what he promises to do. That's what this new covenant is. It's promising, promising us that he can make us that. He can make us a light on a hill, a city that is set on a hill that can't be hidden. You know, we set about trying to make it happen. But what he wants us to do is trust him. Believe him. Just trust him. Never doubt him. Just trust him. No matter what, trust him. He can make us the salt of the earth. He can make us the kind of person who loves his enemies and despises no one. He can make us someone who in his heart is perfect, blessed, sanctified. And I've already talked about that. Uh, the Bible calls it, in, in Romans 5, calls it imputed righteousness. It's righteousness that's given to us as a gift. When we look at Hebrews, and as we've been going through Hebrews, um, Hebrews is designed to inspire faith. And um, that's why I want you to read it over and over again. It sort of ends in the faith chapter, but everything go that goes before is designed to inspire our faith and to just um, incentivize us to have faith. And just to review those things quickly, uh, things like... Um, there was no mediator in this covenant. Moses was the mediator of the old covenant. In the new covenant, there's no mediator. It's God making a covenant with himself. So there's no mediator. Um, he made it by an oath. The old covenant didn't have an oath. The new one has an oath made by God himself. Because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, surely blessing, I'll bless you. And because of it, it says we can have a strong confidence. We can have a strong faith to come into the very presence of God and there be changed by him, be made new, be sanctified, be set apart, be made a city set on a hill. And it comes from coming into the presence of God by faith. Just coming by faith. Uh, another thing that's better is instead of um, instructing us, it changes us. Everybody knows him. How do you know him? Because he lives in me. You know? We all know him. He is our teacher. Matthew 20 says, Don't call any man your teacher on the earth because one is your teacher. Who is that? That's Jesus. And he lives in you by the power of the Holy Spirit. So he teaches you. And, um, and if I am standing up here teaching and something speaks to your heart, that's him doing it. I can't do that. He does it. He's the only one who can. So always looking to him for your teacher. You know, you come to church and you say, man, I hope Roman has a good sermon today. You know, I, I really need a good sermon today. Hey, well, pray, you know. Jesus is the one who speaks. I might, he might not speak through me today. He might speak through someone else. It might be some person just walking out the door making an offhand comment. It goes straight to your heart and changes you forever. You'll never be the same again. But that's why we come together. That's why we come together to fellowship, because Jesus is in our midst. He said, we're two or three are gathered together. I am there in the midst of you, and he wants to minister to us. You know, we don't know exactly how he's going to do that on a given Sunday, but we know he's at it. And he's always doing things that go beyond what we can see. So we don't know for sure what all is going on. So, um, so thank God for that. But we're all taught of God. And um, like he said in one place, that um, he said, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me, but you won't come to me that you might have life. <clears throat> so when I think about the new covenant and what it does, um, I think about who I am. What is my identity? And um, to do that, I'm going to first preface it with that great scripture that I love in uh, Hebrews 1. I, I won't bother you with the uh, King James again this time, but you can read it as many times as you want. It's like the word of God is like that. It's like there's always something fresh 
And this, just this morning, I was reading this again, and it just hit me. This is amazing. Um, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. I mean, that just rolls right over your heads, doesn't it? Wonderful. It's just um, amazing. But anyway, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. So you're talking about almighty God, you know. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of God. By himself purged our sins. Can you believe it? Can you really believe it? That I am clean because he did it. Because he said it. I am clean. Absolutely clean. I can't make myself any cleaner. Because he said it. And um, it's faith. Faith in that. Faith in that promise. Faith in that covenant. When you read through the book of Hebrews, it's all about building up our faith. Why we can have faith in him. Because he's so much better than the angels. You know? He became one of us. He is a high priest forever after the power of an endless life. He has a whole different dynamic in his priesthood. It's not just going through the rote and motion, but he has life to impart to us. And, you know, you could just go on and on. But that, what does this do for me? What, it's, what it does for me is that I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. How does a creation come into being anyway? Hebrews 11 tells us that we understand that things are made out of things which don't appear. In other words, God's word formed it. What I am in Christ is formed by the word of God. He said it, therefore it's true. And that's how it was in the creation story. Isn't that true? He said, let there be light, and there was light. He said, I'm clean, therefore I'm clean. He said, I'm a new creation, Brand new. Something new has happened. And I'm new. Okay? And it's activated when I believe it. When I just accept it and believe it. Trust him. It's true that you have to give something up. It's like you have to let go of all the other things you trust in. That's the hard part. It's just let go of all that. And just trust him. Trust his word. I am a son of God. I am redeemed. I am born again. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I can see. Why? Because he said so. See? And I believed it. So that's true. The list could just go on and on. It's all because God said so. He declared it to be so, and therefore it was so. So I have a better messenger with a better message of a better promise based on a better sacrifice by a better priest in a better tabernacle, not on earth, but in heaven, all because of a better covenant. And by faith, I shall live it out through the power of his life in me. And that's available for each one of us. We go from grace to grace, from faith to faith, and that's how we grow. We exercise the faith that we have. And we ask God to increase it, give us more. As we use what we have, he gives us more. And so our faith increases and the sanctification spreads and, and we become what God envisioned that we could be. It's all by faith. Jesus once illustrated, he said, it's like as if you went out and planted a seed in your garden. And you got up morning and night and watched it carefully but you don't know how it grows. It just grows by itself because there's life in it. And that's how it is for us. And we can believe in it. See, we can believe in that. We can believe in it for ourselves as individuals and we can believe in it for ourselves as a fellowship. That the life of God can cause us to grow. It'll cause us to grow um, sort of in, in breadth in a sense in development personal development and corporate development, but I believe it will also cause us to grow in 
being a testimony to others and bringing others to Christ. So, um, and it's all by faith, believing the promise of God. That's all it's based on. We have all these great and precious promises through which we become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through us. That's it, folks. It's that simple. Don't go off on some rabbit trail. You know, um, I was just reading this morning again a book that I read probably 30 years ago. And I was really taken in by it. I mean, I, it was a book on the covenant. And it was things that we need to do to respond to it in order to activate it. And, and frankly, when I first came to Shaw, I was pretty burned out, you know. I had worked so hard, and it really never amounted to very much. And so, um, but in the years prior to coming to Shaw even, it was like God began to work in my heart. It was like I was always so concerned about working, um, helping other people. And we poured out our life, Kay and I did, and our family did, serving people and helping other people. And it was like God said, okay, you've done enough of that. Now I'm going to move you over here, and I'm going to start working with you. you know? I'm going to help you. First thing he did, one of the first things is he gave me a vision. And in the vision, Kay and I were 12 years old. And I had been in ministry for maybe 30 years, 25 years at least. And here we were. 12 years old spiritually. And it's just time to grow up, you know. So maybe I'm a teenager now, I'm not sure. But, <laughs> but I'm okay with it because I have faith. I believe that God is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond what I can ask or think. I believe that God is able to take me further than I could imagine. And so much is you know, up to him in a sense. But, um, but I know that I've often lost faith in the interim. You know, it's like our faith gets tested. We have to wait. Everything gets thrown in the way. Everything gets put into our path to block our path. And, and we can't understand what's going on and why things don't work out the way we thought they were going to. And you could just go on and on and our faith is tested. But hang in there. Read the book of Hebrews, you know. Let your faith be inspired one more time. Just believe God, believe his promises, and then expect great things. Because he is able to do what he promises to do. Thank God for that. Okay, let's, um, let's stand together. We'll have a, um, a benediction. Again, I'm going to take it out of the book of Hebrews. And then we'll have prayer and close with the doxology. <clears throat> this is such a wonderful benediction out of Hebrews 13. Now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever.